Thank you, thank you Sri and thanks Dr. Ali for inviting me here. It's a pleasure to be at the clinic in this uh, beautiful place and uh, I welcome all the audience. Um, so my talk today um, would be a, a basic introduction about near-infrared spectroscopy. I know that uh, many of us are familiar with it as a technology but uh, I'm taking it today from a more clinical perspective and what's the clinical utility of using NEARS and I'm trying to uh, ultimately answer the question if we actually ready to use this uh, as a clinical tool or not. Uh, so uh, that's basically my objectives. We'll go over the basic principles of NEARS. We'll identify the role of NEARS in different clinical scenarios and um, we'll define the rule of news in clinical practice. Uh, at the end, I will touch on some of the uh, research projects I'm involved in uh, regarding the future uh, technology uh, we are aiming for. So uh, as a reminder, the near infrared spectroscopy uh, depends on an octode that actually is able to uh, emit light um, and have a detection probe that able to receive this light back. The idea is that uh, we, this device is able to emit light in the near infrared uh, spectrum um, and this light as it reflects back to the, through the tissues uh, have get uh, absorbed by different uh, chromophobes so get absorbed by oxygenated hemoglobin and deoxygenated hemoglobin and other tissues and by the way the light reflect back uh, this device is able to uh, identify the concentration of these elements and uh, by convention this is about an area about two to three centimeter um, under this uh, probe uh, so if you put it on the scalp you'll be able to capture the different level of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin about two to three centimeter uh, below the scalp tissue. And uh, being able to measure this uh, oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin, uh, the device is able to calculate what's called the regional oxygen saturation, uh, which is basically the ratio of oxygenated hemoglobin to the total hemoglobin at this area. Um, and this will be actually the number I'll be using in my presentation today and the reason for this because most of the commercially available devices this is the only number that's usually shown on it um, and it has different name but uh, we'll use uh, regional oxygen saturation as our uh, name for it today. There's other names like tissue oxygenation index and other names uh, which means the same thing. Um, this regional oxygenation saturation uh, because it's looking at this specific area, it's a mixed tissue saturation. And uh, it's really more affected by the venous circulation than arteria. Uh, there's an estimation, it's about 70% venous and 30% arteria, so it's a real mixed uh, uh, tissue saturation and more venous than arteria. Um, another number that, that typically get used in many uh, studies is looking at uh, tissue oxygen extraction and this is usually done by a very estimated way and basically you try to subtract the the regional oxygen saturation from the systemic oxygen saturation and you divide this on the systemic saturation by doing this you are estimating how much oxygen was extracted in this tissue and specifically the brain and so my talk today is about cerebral oxygen saturation because there's a lot of also work in uh, systemic uh, regional saturation like renal or mesenteric but my focus will be on the brain saturation. So uh, the first question whenever you start to introduce this technology is some people will ask you what's normal? What's normal for baby? Um, Unfortunately, uh, there's not an easy answer for this because the way this uh, near infrared spectroscopy is designed is really look more as a trend. It's not really able to capture the absolute number. Um, however, uh, because there was really so many babies uh, that has been monitored over the years, uh, we can get that estimate where most of the babies actually are. 
Um, so the larger report came from the Netherlands, and this report has uh, almost 1,000 babies less than 32 weeks. And uh, what they found that the average cerebral saturation was about um, like 70, and if you take plus minus two standard deviation is like 55 to 85. So basically, that's the, most babies will be within that range. And this uh, graph is from this paper that shows a regional cerebral saturation as a function of postnatal age. And you can see there's more or less stability in this number. And they try to look at different age groups, although generally there is increase in saturation as babies uh, get older. Um, this also, uh, overall, this number uh, work well, that this uh, 70 plus minus 15. Um, and the other question, when do you start to get these numbers? Actually, it's really fast, so people have tried to look into trying to measure the cerebral saturation immediately after birth. And um, you can get measurements like within one or two minutes. And at three minutes, you're like more in the mid 40s. By the time you're seven to eight minutes, you reach the mid 70s. So you reach more or less uh, expected range of saturation. This was a nice uh, study that actually, uh, it's called the Neoprem trial, uh, which I, I just read it a couple of months ago, which came from uh, San Diego, and uh, they actually tried to uh, start babies on immediate monitor monitoring with both NIRS and amplitude integrated EEG. Uh, in the delivery room, aiming uh, to get about 10 minutes of recording as soon as possible in the DR. And the goal was to see if really this early measurement um, is associated with um, outcome. And um, they found that um, if you compare those who had normal um, ultrasound or um, mild uh, IVH compared to those who had severe IVH or those who died, although the number was really small, uh, they could demonstrate that there was a significant difference uh, between this group and this, like between eight to ten minutes of life that these babies who died who had severe IVH, they started by significantly lower uh, saturation. So, so that I'm just putting this there to say that it's a tool that uh, can be used right from the delivery room, um, and we are getting data from multiple centers that successfully use it even in the delivery room. Um, and the always question as we introduce this as a clinical tool, uh, what does it mean? Uh, it's very easy to look at the systemic saturation and say, okay, we want this uh, saturation to be within this target uh, because we want to avoid hypoxia and hyperoxia. So that's very well understood. Um, I think that one of the complexity of uh, sneers in addition to the being a trend and not an absolute number, that it can actually mean a lot of uh, different things. And so the things that really affect the cerebral saturation are um, oxygen delivery, cerebral perfusion, and oxygen consumption. So um, if you have decrease in your cerebral saturation, this could be due to that you have actually less amount of blood going to your brain, so decrease perfusion, or maybe less amount of oxygen delivered to the brain. And since this is more like a venous saturation, it also, if you have increased consumption, you'll have lower saturation. So that puts a little complexity. So when you look at the number, you need to think about these three things. Is it decreased delivery, um, oxygen delivery, is it decreased perfusion, or it's increased consumption? And the opposite. So if you have, if you have increased cerebral saturation, that could reflect increased oxygen delivery or increased perfusion or decreased consumption. So uh, my next part will be just to go into some clinical scenarios uh, where you will see decreased cerebral saturation. Then we'll talk about uh, scenarios which we have increased cerebral saturation uh, with four, more focus on the preterm infants. And then we'll talk about two um, other populations, the HIE patients as well as uh, babies with congenital heart disease.
Um, so uh, things that in your clinical practice that could be associated with decreased saturation could be hypocarbia, anemia, hypotension, uh, hyperinflation, PDA, apnea, uh, germinal matrix, uh, intraventricular hemorrhage, and post hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation. So we'll go over each of these and just to uh, give a couple of uh, presentation from uh, studies that looked at these uh, scenarios. Uh, so the relation between carbon dioxide and cerebral blood flow, I think we always talk about this for uh, so many years, and this is a very old graph from Rhesus Monkey uh, trying to see the relation between cerebral blood volume in the y-axis with uh, uh, PaCO2 in the x-axis. And uh, the general consensus that the more carbon dioxide, the more hypercarbia you, the baby has, the more um, increased cerebral uh, flow and cerebral perfusion. And the opposite, if you have low carbon dioxide and hypocarbia, you have uh, decreased cerebral flow. Uh, uh, we just published a paper with Dr. Ali that actually trying to challenge this, uh, but I'm not going uh, to this in my talk today, but I would say this is a general uh, consensus, a physiologic consensus. Uh, and because of this, people try to see, so if we are worried about hypocarbia and decreased perfusion, do we actually see babies who have low carbon dioxide developing uh, brain ischemia? Uh, this was an old uh, paper from NICHD, large number of babies, um, uh, less than 1250 grams, and uh, 489 of them had hypocarbia. And they looked at different things. They looked at the lower carbon dioxide, but, you know, but also they looked at what they called the cumulative hypocarbia exposure. And basically they looked at that number of like how much below 35 these babies are and multiply by the hours of they spent into this hypocarbia. So it ended by these groups with different uh, quartiles of cumulative hypocarbia. And what they found that really the, the babies who are exposed to uh, highest cumulative hypocarbia uh, had really increased risk of uh, periventricular leukomalacia. Uh, so this is one of the like, studies that confirmed this concept that really hypocarbia could end by uh, brain ischemia. So the question is, can we actually see this by near-infrared spectroscopy? And this was a study done by Laura Dix in uh, Utrecht in the Netherlands. It was a retrospective study. They all have these babies already in near-infrared spectroscopy. So she looked, uh, they always put in the first 72 hours. And she looked at these uh, just 38 ventilated babies first 72 hours. Average uh, gestation age was 29 weeks. And she looks at periods of acute decrease in carbon dioxide. So they define this as uh, carbon dioxide goes less than um, five lower than the baseline, and this will continue for an hour. And they looked in the hour before and the hour after, and uh, they could see that uh, they looked at different things. They looked at in uh, tidal CO2, uh, so this is uh, before the hypocarbic event, and this is during this hypocarbic event, and this is after. And when they looked at the cerebral saturation, they could see the same trend. So as uh, carbon dioxide goes down, this baby's cerebral saturation went down. I would say this is uh, one of the things I see it on the bedside, and sometimes this helps us on the bedside if you're hyperventilating a baby that sometimes we, the first thing to see is actually uh, that the cerebral saturation goes down. Uh, the second um, factor that could be associated with a clinical scenario that could be associated with low uh, cerebral saturation is anemia. Um, and again, the idea that cerebral saturation uh, is affected by oxygen delivery and the more anemia you have, the more like the less oxygen delivery you have. As, and this uh, was just a uh, study, it was a prospective study in the Netherlands, 33 babies just trying to see uh, their hemoglobin level before transfusion and their cerebral saturation. And you can see there was a, a 
more or less like a positive correlation between the hemoglobin level and the cerebral saturation. So the question is, can we actually use this as a tool to help us to know if you are going to transfuse or not? I would say many babies we know exactly when to transfuse, but in many other cases we have this borderline that it can go either way. So the question, would this help you to know uh, which baby uh, you would rather transfuse or not? Um, in the same study, they looked at the cerebral saturation after transfusion. Uh, so in this curve, you can see this is a cerebral saturation uh, before transfusion and then one hour after transfusion and then 24 hours after transfusion. And they divided them based on their baseline. So it's also has hemoglobin less than 6, 6 to 7, or more than 7. And they transfused 15 ml per kilo. So the most, I would say, impressive thing that uh, it's not just a transient effect. You didn't give, like, when you give these babies blood, their cerebral saturation went up. And it continues. So even after 24 hours, this baby's cerebral saturation continues to be high. And uh, this was uh, the case at different level of hemoglobin. And the most significant actually change was in those we have lower uh, hemoglobin to start with. Uh, so I, again, I, 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 there's no time to go over cases in my talk today, but I would say I've seen at least a couple of cases where this was a trigger to get a hemoglobin on the baby and the baby needed transfusion. Uh, we don't, uh, it's very, uh, there's no, Sometimes there's different uh, providers has different frequency of labs, but you don't have any way to monitor this baby's hemoglobin uh, continuously. So this could help you to decide to uh, get a hematocrit for a baby who have unexplained uh, decreased cerebral saturation. The third point is about autoregulation and um, uh, the importance of this because I want to to say that NEARS could help you also in um, cases with hypotension. So before, to explain this, I want to say first that autoregulation uh, is a very important phenomena and uh, that means that you have more or less stable cerebral blood f uh, flow um, to the brain uh, when you have a change in your cerebral perfusion and uh, specifically uh, to be practically with different blood pressure. So in adults, uh, this curve shows you that uh, even with different change in uh, mean arterial blood pressure, it takes a while for the cerebral blood flow to change. So we have this lower end of autoregulation when hypotension causes decreased perfusion. Then you have this large plateau where there's no change. And then you have the upper limit of autoregulation when if you have higher blood pressure, you have increased cerebral perfusion. Uh, in units, there's a couple of problems. First, that this area of plateau is very short. And so autoregulation is not very mature in our uh, population. And the other issue that most of our babies uh, mean arterial blood pressure is really towards the lower end of this autoregulation curve. And people got interested in this uh, many, many years ago. This paper came from Boston uh, now almost 20 years ago where they tried to look at babies who have intact autoregulation versus cerebral, um, uh, what we call pressure passivity. So this is an example of this paper. They looked at, um, they used the near infrared spectroscopy, and in this uh, study specifically, they looked at hemoglobin D, which is basically the difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin, and they used it as a surrogate of uh, blood flow. It's not a perfect surrogate, but this is like one of the way to estimate how is your blood flow. And they, these babies have continuous uh, blood pressure monitoring and cerebral saturation, uh, systemic saturation monitoring. And uh, they put these two examples in this paper that uh, this is a one day old, 28 weeker. And uh, what you see that the blood pressure has all this alteration and going up and down uh, and uh, cerebral perfusion uh, uh, or the hemoglobin D did not change. And they differentiated this from who are like have cerebral passive circulation. And if you see in this uh, one on the right, uh, that this as the uh, mean arterial blood pressure changes, you have exactly matching change in the um, hemoglobin D. 
so this is uh, what they call coherence uh, between the change in pressure and change in several saturation or change in several flow is a marker that you have a uh, passive uh, or circulation in the brain. And at least in this specific example, they could uh, show this baby had normal ultrasound, these babies had uh, subsequent PVL, but they also published other papers showing that these babies have higher risk of uh, brain injury. And uh, so why I'm saying this because uh, we babies are at risk for brain injury. They can easily get affected by hypotension. Uh, we, until today, we don't know what number uh, should we used to treat babies hypotension. Um, I don't think the NIRS give a full answer to this. I think it's an extra tool um, because um, some studies did demonstrate that hypotension was associated with decreased cerebral saturation. Um, others really did not see this. Um, what we know in general, if your number is really low, like less than 50%, that definitely was associated with worse outcome. So my, my take with hypotension is an extra tool. You look at the blood pressure, you look at the perfusion, you look at the lactate, you look at your output. Uh, uh, do you care about looking about your brain perfusion? I think everyone cares. So the NIRS does give you a tool to see if this borderline blood pressure is affecting the cerebral perfusion or not. Um, other things that's not like the respiratory relation with uh, brain I think is an amazing area and one of the things we sometimes see that you have babies on very increased um, mean airway pressure or you switch a baby from a conventional to an oscillator or a jet and then you're suddenly starting to see decreased blood pressure or um, uh, really affecting your cardiac output so this will be also a tool to help you to uh, if you reach a point that's really affecting your cerebral uh, flow, that will be a dangerous point. Um, the information about PDA is also um, a little um, not very clear. How can we use the NIRS to, uh, for patent doctors how to use this? Uh, there are studies that show the more hemodynamically significant PDA, you have uh, decreased cerebral saturation. Um, but really the studies regarding treatment uh, it was not very consistent, like does treatment help to improve this? Uh, so this continues to be an area of uh, debate about the utility of NIRS in this uh, PDA management. Um, and the other things we see a lot of the times, we see a lot of babies who have these spells or apneas or desaturation. Um, I, um, many of the times we dismiss this, um, at least in our place sometimes, oh, the probe was not there, like I was not there. Um, and when you see this happening, uh, both at the pulse ox level and you see cerebral saturation, you know it's real and it's not just real, it's really affecting the brain. Uh, so the, Again, it's a question how, like, if the NIRS finding will help you to know what apneic spells are really uh, significant. Uh, we know that the cerebral saturation is really get lower when apnea is treated with bradycardia uh, than when apnea is not treated with bradycardia. Um, the German matrix IVH is, uh, as I said, uh, people are trying to predict can we actually predict which baby will have hemorrhage? Um, many of the things we uh, will talk about which increase cerebral saturation can actually lead to, uh, if it's increased cerebral flow, we think that increased cerebral flow is a predisposing factor of developing uh, of German matrix hemorrhage. Um, so we think about the perfusion and over perfusion to be an important predisposing factor with so many other factors. Um, so we know that if you monitor these babies from the first day of life and uh, these babies who develop hemorrhage, they actually were shown to have increased cerebral saturation uh, before the hemorrhage developed. Once the injury happens, actually it's the opposite and you see lower cerebral uh, saturation in these babies. And one of the uh, scenarios we actually are really uh, frustrated with is post hemorrhagic ventricular dilatation um, and when to intervene. When, when is the ventricles really, uh, what's large enough that you need to go and intervene? 
Um, so there was a lot of debate. Uh, we were waiting for the randomized trial to come back, and the results uh, is just you know was uh, publicly announced, and we don't see it yet a good answer. All what we know that uh, as the ventricles get larger, you are causing a lot of damage. You are uh, just distending the ventricles can decrease the cerebral perfusion. You are just, uh, stretching your neurons. You're causing a lot of uh, damage by more um, distension of these ventricles. So this uh, paper is just showing uh, the change in cerebral saturation. Um, in babies before and after uh, putting an external ventricular drain. Uh, these are a very small number of babies and uh, dark gray uh, was actually the cerebral saturation before uh, intervention. And right after the intervention, you can see that the cerebral uh, saturation recovers. So that's also, uh, we are trying to use it in our places. One of the information uh, that you keep in mind is really this baby's brain getting uh, less perfusion. Are we seeing significant decrease in the cerebral saturation as one of the factors that can help with decision making? So um, these are the things that I pointed to decrease cerebral saturation. The things that I would say commonly would be increasing your cerebral saturation. This would be less common. Um, I'm going back to hypercarbia. I think this would be the most important uh, factor that you, you can have a very uh, nice continuous way of monitoring uh, cerebral uh, perfusion. As we mentioned, we are worried about hypercarbia to be associated with increased cerebral perfusion. And we are worried about increased perfusion being a risk for IVH. Uh, this was a retrospective study in this uh, slide. Uh, looked at four, 574 uh, babies, and they looked at their uh, maximum CO2 in the first three days of life and the probability of developing severe IVH. But it, I think it's just a nice curve showing that really the maximum CO2, um, at least in this study, uh, was associated with increased probability of IVH. Um, I will go back again to uh, Laura Dick's study. They, when they looked at the babies who have hypocarbia events, they also looked at those who have hypercarbia events and the same figure. So as these babies have increased in tidal CO2, um, they could actually see a uh, matching increase in their cerebral uh, saturation. Uh, so uh, the NIRS can add an extra layer of uh, monitoring. In our unit, we use transcutaneous CO2 to monitor the carbon dioxide. People have different beliefs about it. Many people don't believe the number. But I, I tell you, when the carbon dioxide goes up and the NIRS goes up, they know it's real. Like It's really uh, reconfirming uh, uh, the information and adding more to your um, I would say, I think your threshold to intervene would be much higher or like lower actually to uh, intervene if you think that uh, it's a real number. And hyperoxia, we've uh, really, uh, that's a tricky part because we just try to keep our systemic saturation within target. This is also one of the areas of controversy, uh, what the best auction uh, target um, and we know that hyperoxia is a bad thing. I would say um, it's, uh, it's if you like have a range of saturation and you see that your cerebral saturation is way high, maybe you want to go to the lower side of this range. Uh, this was one study from St. Louis where they looked at actually um, ROP ba babies and what they found in this study that uh, it was the cerebral saturation that was more associated uh, with ROP uh, more than like the systemic saturation. So, um, so it's another way to look at these babies. Um, sometimes uh, for treating pulmonary hypertension, uh, some centers use uh, preductal saturation rather than postductal. Um, and uh, unfortunately, we try to keep these babies uh, 
actually postdoctoral saturation uh, sometimes high and to do this we've turned this oxygen much higher than what the baby needs and so I've seen so many babies their cerebral saturation stays 95 for days uh, because people try to correct the shunting and decrease um, and improve the postdoctoral saturation of these babies so so we're still this news could give you more information how much oxygen is really the baby's brain is seeing and can make you more concerned about the amount, the amount of oxygen you're giving. Um, and that same controversy about hypotension, it's also controversy about uh, enotropes. Is enotropes actually uh, associated with worse outcome or associated with improved outcomes? So there are many studies that uh, showed uh, different outcomes. Um, I think our um, management, our hemodynamic management would be much better if it is really adding this near infrared spectroscopy as a, another way to look at um, how the change in blood pressure is affecting the brain perfusion. So these were my like scenarios in preterm babies. Um, the two other uh, cohort I would uh, touch on is uh, neonatal encephalopathy and uh, we mean the hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy and people looked at this even before hypothermia uh, was used. So this is a paper from uh, 2006 um, from uh, Mona Tooth and uh, what she was just trying to compare babies um, who have hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy, how their uh, cerebral saturation changes over the first two days of life. And she looked at two groups. She looked at those who had normal outcome and those with uh, white uh, bars and those who have uh, either death or have abnormal outcome. And what they found like after 24 hours, uh, those who have abnormal outcome tend to have higher cerebral saturation. Um, the hypothesis behind why babies who have severe brain injury have higher saturation, uh, one hypothesis is that the uh, brain is not extracting enough oxygen, so your oxygen extraction goes down because of the severe injury, so your mixed saturation goes up. I would say some other data which came from uh, Boston Children's with uh, Ellen Grant team actually, uh, when they could differentiate um, oxygen delivery versus perfusion, actually perfusion was the main factor. So we think actually that babies who have more injury have more cerebral perfusion following injury. Uh, so it's actually a marker of increased perfusion in those who have uh, significant injury. Uh, what about cooling? Um, as cooling uh, start to be uh, used, this also came from the Netherlands. Uh, I think I mentioned the Netherlands like 10 times so far in this talk, um, but they really have been using it for so many years. And this was also a very simple study that looked at those who have uh, hypoxic ischemic encephalopathy receiving hypothermia. And they looked at cerebral saturation over the first uh, 84 hours. Uh, so one, something you notice is that the cerebral saturation slightly goes up, so I think that's expected. Uh, as you cool babies, their oxygen metabolism gets lower, so the oxygen extraction will be lower, so you will see regardless uh, increased saturation when you cool a baby. Um, but what they found when they tried to compare, again, those who had a normal outcome, and this is a solid line here, with those who either died or had impairment, uh, that those who have a normal outcome had higher saturation, and after rewarming it didn't go down, it continued to be on the high uh, level. So the use of NIRS in this population is more like a prognostic uh, tool, and uh, people try to use it actually in combination with AEG, and this was really the highest predictive value for MRI uh, detected brain injury and worse outcome. So uh, we're getting more evidence that uh, adding this um, in the baby who get cooled, adding the uh, information from the news to your AEG improves your predictive uh, value, and this happens really early in the course. Um, and the question about congenital heart disease, Dr. Ali told me that uh, people here um, 
I'm anxious and want to learn about how to use this in congenital heart disease. This is not babies I treat in general. Uh, we treat very mild uh, congenital heart diseases. Uh, but actually, the use of NEOs in the cardiac ICU uh, is really uh, more adopted than NICU. So I've seen many, many cardiac ICUs that use NEOs as part of their uh, monitoring. Uh, but it, and it makes sense because as uh, we, for many decades now we understood how important the uh, new developmental outcome of these babies and that we know that babies who have congenital heart disease are at higher risk of the new developmental disability and impairment. Um, Although uh, this multifactorial, uh, there's some genetic factors, there's a lot of other factors, uh, including the uh, physiology of the heart disease, but really disturbance in cerebral hemodynamics in utero, uh, preoperative, intraoperatively, and postoperatively could contribute to this brain injury. So if you have a tool to monitor your cerebral hemodynamics in this scenario, uh, probably you'll be able to have better way to manage these babies. Uh, and there are papers that are like looking at how cerebral saturation um, is associated with outcome. Um, I just put three examples uh, looking at three uh, periods. So uh, babies who have no pre-existing brain damage, the lower their pre-operative cerebral saturation uh, was associated with worse neurodevelopmental outcome. Um, and there's another paper that looked at actually the decrease in cerebral saturation intraoperatively, and this was also associated with worse outcome. And uh, the work, um, uh, one of our colleagues uh, did at DC Children's um, was Dr. Jonas uh, Sosafwat looked at actually postoperatively, and he could show that combining cerebral saturation with um, higher lactate level uh, was very predictive of death or uh, worse neurodevelopmental outcome. So uh, that's again general um, knowledge that lower saturation, this baby is not good. Um, uh, then the question always comes, okay, yes, we know it's not good, but the question, if we start to use uh, NEOs in our uh, congenital heart disease, are we able to improve the outcome? And uh, clearly there's no like randomized trial done explicitly to look at this um, uh, like question. And uh, this is, a, I think it's very well uh, written uh, review article that just came out. Uh, it came from Boston Children's uh, uh, with Dr. Zaliski and uh, Dr. Kosman and I think it's very uh, interesting and uh, nice article showing what we know so far about uh, the use of NEARS in this uh, population. Um, and that the neonatologists were in the same boat. They said, okay, can we actually use this NEARS to improve outcome? And um, we a little bit uh, at least uh, in my hospital become a little uh, not happy about this question because now people are saying does doing MRI for a new need does it improve outcome so what about doing an x-ray does it improve outcome like uh, like it's not it's not an intervention we're talking about a diagnostic tool something to tell you how your baby is doing so the question is a little uh, may not be the the most appropriate. Do you want this information? Would it help you? I think that was the question and I'm trying to convince you that it is helpful information. However, like I will talk about two trials uh, were done in uh, Europe. Uh, this was called the uh, God's God trial, which stands for cerebral vision, tissue auction saturation to guide auction delivery. So this is a group um, in Austria which really um, focused on uh, early measurement of cerebral saturation from the delivery room. So they uh, randomized babies in the delivery room either to be monitored with NEARS, uh, which is visible to the provider, or uh, NEARS, which is not visible. And they try to uh, change their uh, delivery of auction in the delivery room using uh, certain guidelines and trying to keep the cerebral saturation within target. Um, and as expected, if you look just at the burden of cerebral hypoxia, uh, 
Definitely, if you know that the cerebral saturation is low, you give oxygen, so you actually decrease the risk of having cerebral hypoxia. Um, so they did not answer the question yet, so what next, what, like how this would affect the outcome. So this is a God's God 3 trial, which is uh, really looking at this intervention, would it affect uh, uh, mortality or cerebral injury. And the other trial that looked at after that, not in the delivery room, they looked, it's called the Safe Boost C trial, uh, standing for safeguarding the brain of our smallest children. Um, and in this trial, they, it was a multi-center randomized trial, and this is in the NICU. So they randomized babies to be on the nears in the first 72 hours. These are extremely preterm infants, uh, less than 28 weeks. And you have a group that uh, actually the clinician could see the nears and the group that the clinician could not see the nears. So for those who actually could see the nears, there was a certain protocol that tells them, okay, if the cerebral saturation is less than 55, you think about the things I, I just talked about, like uh, how is the cardiovascular status, how is the oxygen transport, how is the respiratory status. If there anything of this is uh, altered, you should go in and treat it. And if the cerebral saturation is high, the same uh, thought process, you look at different things trying to correct that. And they encourage people not to use FI2 to correct this, because there's so many other things that you actually uh, should be doing uh, to correct the cerebral saturation. Um, so this, I just put all the results of the different papers that came from this trial. Uh, the, the positive findings, less cerebral hypoxia, ex expected. Again, if you see the cerebral saturation, you're actively trying to correct it, most likely you'll be able to correct uh, cerebral hypoxia. Uh, they did post hoc analysis to just say, is cerebral hypoxemia something bad or not? And at least in this post hoc analysis, they could show that cerebral hypoxemia it was associated with increased intracranial hemorrhage, uh, lower birth rate on EEG, and increased mortality. So it was like indirect relation. Then they tried to look at different other outcomes, and really the two-year uh, new developmental outcome came uh, just this year, and uh, didn't show a difference between those who, uh, uh, two groups. But this study was not powered to look at different in outcome. It was just powered to look at feasibility and this ability to control the cerebral saturation. Uh, so actually now they are trying to enroll 1,600 baby in multicenter trial uh, to answer this question. If you try to control this baby's cerebral saturation the first three days of life, are you able to improve their outcome or not? So. Are we using NIRS clinically? This, um, I in our special interest group, uh, a couple of years ago, I sent a survey, uh, but I, it was a smaller number, but this paper actually is a large number. Uh, they surveyed, it is more like multinational, international, 235 NICUs, 255 responders asking neonatologists, do you use NIRS in your unit? and uh, they're focusing just on the number of NICUs, so the majority actually do not have near infrared spectroscopy. And so those uh, who have owned the NIRS, uh, like those who don't own the NIRS actually are not planning to have it. Uh, so they really uh, gave up on the whole idea. Uh, those who own it, um, it's uh, mixed between just for research, just for clinical, or a mixture of uh, both. And I think that the big barrier here that 59% uh, say, okay, we need more research. Uh, there's part of course, but uh, people are basically want more research uh, before doing this. Um, but then my proposal here, like, should we use this technology or really we should wait for uh, more research? Um, in our unit, we felt like this will take decades. You have a FDA approved tool that's able to give you an extra piece of information that's uh, non-invasive. And you should uh, take the opportunity and give these babies the opportunity to know all the information about what's happening in their brain. 
Uh, so we did have starting in January of last year, uh, January 2018, put a protocol uh, for routine use of near infrared spectroscopy in our unit. And we are using it in all preterm babies less than 28 weeks for the first 72 hours of life, knowing that this is the most critical uh, period for developing brain injury. We are having other indications um, which is not as strict, it's still provider dependent, like if you have significant anemia, if you are enotropes or significant respiratory support or hemodynamically like significant PDA or progressive dilatation of your hydrocephalus. Um, and the other population that we uh, have been routinely monitoring is those babies who are actually cool. So this became part of the hypothermia protocol that we monitor them uh, with uh, NIRS. And again, we put like case by case. Uh, so this is a tool available that uh, the neonatologist can ask for at any point. Um, and we put at each uh, bedside. So each machine has this algorithm, which because uh, whenever I'm going to use near the question will be, what does it mean? What does it mean if you have decreased cerebral saturation or increased cerebral saturation? And basically we try to summarize uh, the thought process we just talked about and we encourage provider that there is nothing, there's no one answer. So if you see a change in your cerebral saturation, this cannot tell you exactly what to do. It just tell you, let's check a few things. Do you know what the hematocrit of this baby? If you don't for days, you can check it. You can actually transfuse the baby if the hematocrit is low. Uh, you can look at the systemic saturation. Um, what about if this was reflecting decreased perfusion? What is the blood pressure of the baby? What's your mean airway pressure? Have you checked your carbon dioxide? Um, and uh, it could be related to increased oxygen consumption, which we don't really see. I think that's uh, uh, at least uh, it's, it's uh, hypothetically if you have think significant agitation or seizures. So my screen is different here, but uh, it's working. Um, so um, we have this also in our um, algorithm. And we have a second page for higher cerebral saturation uh, that tells people if your baby is suddenly your cerebral saturation goes up, you want to think, is, are you giving too much oxygen? Is there anything that's causing increased cerebral perfusion like hypertension or hypercarbia? Is there anything related to decreased oxygen consumption like severe brain injury or over sedation? Uh, so there is no one scenario which you look at the nerves and just go and do something. It just makes you think about the, your baby more uh, to have better explanation. Sometimes you don't have good explanation. Like you have a baby with saturations like 50%. Um, although there is no, and you checked everything, there's no explanation. Although you might not have something to do, that's still a very poor sign. So that would actually tell you also that you are worried about this baby's uh, over uh, outcome. Um, and in, um, we had a summer student. Again, we used to use this clinically. I had a summer student last uh, summer, and I told her, you know what, let's go and look at all these babies who we called. Are we actually seeing this? Uh, tool uh, helping uh, as a prognostic tool. Uh, so we had 53 babies who uh, received cooling and nears. Um, we have 49 babies we could analyze and we just looked at their MRI report. Some babies had brain injury, some babies had no brain injury. And we tried to replicate what the literature is saying and she came next day with this curve. Babies who have abnormal MRI are having higher cerebral saturation. And this has really become much more clear at the time of rewarming and in the hours after rewarming. So it's real, it's not like, and this was not done for research, it was done just as a clinical tool. And the next step is really we want you as a provider to look at your situation to help you uh, with your uh, care of your baby. Um, 
And we don't think that things will stop there. So we are actu actively involved in research to improve this technology. We understand its limitation. We understand that we really want something that can give us absolute number for cerebral saturation and something that can give us absolute number of cerebral perfusion. We are not there yet. I would say I'm uh, lucky to be involved with two groups. Uh, one of them is looking at babies who are receiving uh, cooling for HIE. And the other group is uh, looking at uh, preterm infants. And they are looking at uh, different technologies called frequency domain mirrors. So this is a technology that's still on a research level. It's not FDA approved, but actually we are able to uh, get absolute number for cerebral uh, saturation. And by doing this, we can actually calculate the cerebral uh, blood volume. However, this is still very labor intense. It needs a lot of um, technical support to be able to do it. And we combine this what's called diffusion correlation spectroscopy, which are different technologies that can actually look at the uh, flow of the red cells in the tissues. So you can actually also look at cerebral perfusion index. So that will solve a big problem that when you, you, when you say that there's increased saturation, you don't know is it increased oxygen delivery or increased flow. If you can actually accurately measure both, uh, you have better information about your baby. And uh, this is, again, how it looked like. It's still a very uh, homemade device. And this is a frequency domain near. This is a DCS. And one of the wonderful things, if you have this absolute number, that you can actually calculate what's called the cerebral metabolic rate of oxygen consumption as a CMRO2. And uh, the goal of the first study actually is to look at how this oxygen consumption uh, changes with hypothermia and we presented this uh, preliminary data showing these are babies there was a control group and this is a group who got like during cooling during the warming during hypothermia and uh, the first uh, graph on the left just look at saturation and we although like some data showed that increased saturation happens during cooling this has not been very consistent we think that hypothermia decreased cerebral perfusion and decreased oxygen metabolism uh, but we think a uh, tool like this uh, when we looked at it we can see that the CMRO2 for babies who get cooled was really low and as you get rewarmed it increased and going back to normal thermia so we think this could be in the future a tool to look at the effect of hypothermia in the brain are we able actually to measure the effect of hypothermia on uh, oxygen metabolism or not and also we have very preliminary data showing that those um, after uh, cooling those who could reach normal thermia uh, the, the normal thermic cerebral oxygen metabolism was positively associated with improved um, uh, cognitive outcome at nine months. Again, very preliminary data that maybe in the future when we cool a baby, we actually can see if the cooling working, are we able to depress the cerebral metabolism? And after the warming, can we see how the baby's metabolism actually uh, recovers after hypothermia? And the other study is using this diffusion correlation spectroscopy, uh, which is focusing on flow because as I said, we're, we're very much believer on the effect of cerebral flow on developing of injury in premature infants. And if we can have a tool that just look at the cerebral flow, uh, we will be very, um, like, that will be very important in taking care of these babies. And this is just a, a doll showing that we, we have the commercially available FDA NEARS. And at the same time, in these babies, we are using the research uh, diffusion correlation spectroscopy uh, if parents consented. So my take-home message is, I think NEARS is helpful to monitor cerebral oxygen delivery and consumption as well as cerebral perfusion. We have a tool that's already FDA approved, it's readily available to be used. Uh, still it needs to be used as a trend and not an absolute number. And in spite that there is no evidence that use of NEARS directly improved NICU outcome, incorporation on clinical care can make clinical decisions uh, more informed and individualized. And um, when, when you implement it, you really need to have clear indications and guidelines how to use it. 
and uh, my last uh, two uh, slides are more like advertisement and this is an, uh, just our uh, special interest group that uh, Siri has actually uh, pointed to. If you're not a member, this, this uh, group is a national and international group uh, who have more than 500 people who are uh, in the field of neonatal neurocritical care and provide many services like an email list and uh, many resources that uh, people can use. If you go to this website, you can just subscribe to this email list. And uh, also, as it was mentioned, uh, this developed four years ago. We are actually uh, uh, just last month we incorporated uh, what we call the Newborn Brain Society uh, that we're actually trying to have a place where all uh, neonatologists, uh, pediatric neurologists, neonatal nurses, and even families who are interested in the area of newborn brain uh, to work together to push this field forward. Uh, that's again our website. Uh, membership will be open in January, um, but uh, uh, we'll make sure that you get some information as this is open. And uh, I just thank all my mentors, collaborators, and teams, and thank you for being here.